I don't know if everybody here appreciates this, Square is on its way now to actually being bigger than, than Twitter, and I want to understand how that even factors into your thinking. This was an interview with Jack Dorsey in 2017, and many were noticing the massive size of his payments company, Square. But Dorsey is famous for more than just Square. Okay, so here's where I'm going with this. Um, it feels to me like Square is your baby, really your baby. Twitter's your baby too. But Square is appearing like it, it could really uh, be on this remarkable ride. But unlike Twitter, where he has been kicked out twice, he has been with Square from the beginning. So how has Dorsey grown Square from startup in 2009 to one of the largest financial companies today? This video will go through the story of Square. Jack Dorsey was born in 1976 and was obsessed with cities and maps from a young age. And I just covered my bedroom walls with maps. Um, this was my favorite thing to read and obviously that's very, very odd. Maps allowed him to explore the world around him and at eight years old, he applied his obsession by using a Macintosh computer that his parents bought him. I resolved to learn how to draw my obsession, how to draw my maps on this computer so I could play with them and so I could see things happen in real time. By 16, he had programmed his own dispatch systems. Um, it was a fake dispatch system. It was built so that I could actually listen to my parents' police scanner, listen to my parents' CB radio. I could type in what I heard. An ambulance is at 5th and Broadway going to St. John's Mercy. Patient cardiac arrest. And I could actually simulate the, the ambulance. Also at 16, and still in high school, he started his first real job. Uh, my co-founder, Jim McKelvey, mm -hmm. is, a, uh, is a glass artist. He was my first boss when I was 15 years old. McKelvey was 11 years older than Dorsey, but he had a lot of confidence in the young kid and surprisingly promoted him to manage a team. In 1995, he left McKelvey's company to study computer science at the University of Missouri Rolla. In his second year, Jack was growing tired of university and wanted to apply his skills at a dispatching firm. A dispatching firm is responsible for scheduling and automating routes, and this particular company did bike courier dispatching. He hacked into the company's website and sent the following email. I emailed the CEO and the, uh, and the chairman, and I, I said, um, my name is Jack, you have a hole in your website, here's how to fix it, and by the way, I write dispatch software. The CEO of the company was actually quite impressed, and Dorsey was offered a job in New York. However, this company soon faced financial difficulties, and Dorsey and the CEO left to start their own online dispatching company. Um, we moved to San Francisco, I moved to Berkeley, and we started a company called DNet, which was a complete and utter failure. Despite DNet being a disaster, he had one notable inspiration while working for the company. Dorsey had always obsessed with what was happening in the city, but he forgot about the people. But I didn't have the people, where are the people? So what if I made a simple service that took an email, uh, I could send it to a service, and then that service would send it out to the people that want to hear it, right? Jack built the software in a weekend. Unfortunately, the idea was ahead of its time. And I typed out a message saying, I'm at the Bison Paddock in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, and that went out to all my friends in real time. And um, I learned two things very quickly. First, uh, no one cared. No one cared at all. <laughs> and then second, um, no one else had a BlackBerry. No one else had this device. So. I put the idea on the shelf uh, in, in 2001. So when DNet failed, Dorsey was unemployed and he moved back home to St. Louis to work for his dad. However, his hands ached from years of programming and a friend recommended him to get a massage. Jack optimistically thought this could become his new career because of his value added twist. So I'd give them code therapy and massage therapy. <laughs> And this was in my own head. I really didn't tell anyone. Once I told someone, they said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> that is never going to fly. He then explored other artistic avenues, such as drawing. Unfortunately, his artistic career did not take off. And at 29, he moved back to the tech scene in San Francisco. He applied to this software podcasting firm called Odeo, but in an unconventional way by only putting his first name on the resume. Still, Jack was quite impressed with himself. I wrote a very simple resume, which uh, was my first resume. And it said Jack, period, life, work, and play. And it just listed a bunch of things. I'd never written a, a resume before, but it was enough to catch uh, Evan Williams and Noah Glass's attention. 
Odeo's founder, Ev Williams, who was also noted in the tech scene for selling Blogger to Google in 2003, was actually quite unimpressed from the first name only application, but he needed a programmer and Jack was hired. Soon after, Ev needed a new business idea because Apple entered the podcasting arena. Odeo launched a hackathon and all employees were encouraged to build their best ideas. Dorsey then presented his idea that he had shelved in 2001. Now we actually have the technology to do that idea. So I brought up that idea to, um, to my teammates at Odeo and uh, they gave me two weeks to build it. Uh, and we, the first tweet was actually me saying inviting my coworkers. And that, would, that went out to all my coworkers and they could get on the system. And With Twitter growing rapidly, it was spun out of Odeo and was incorporated in early 2007, where Dorsey became CEO and Williams remained the largest shareholder. However, Dorsey did not give Twitter his full attention and he was still interested in an artistic career path. Um, so I was always fascinated by jeans and denim uh, because uh, they have this amazing history. They're made originally for scuba divers um, and but he learned. You don't, it turns out you don't start with, uh, with jeans because pants are the hardest thing to make, so you start with skirts. So I learned how to make a, a pencil skirt and asymmetrical skirt. This made Williams very upset at Dorsey and told him, you can either be a dressmaker or CEO, not both. Eventually, with the financial crisis unfolding in 2008, investors reevaluated Dorsey's experience and behavior, and he was fired in October. Despite being out of work, he still owned 4% of the company's stock, and Twitter was worth $80 million, making him wealthy on paper. But Twitter was a startup, and there was no assurance that it would succeed, so Dorsey needed a new idea. In late 2008, he reached out to his former boss, Jim McKelvey. And so Jack said, well, why don't we start a company together? And I was like, okay, cool. And what do you want to do? He's like, I don't know. What do you want to do? The only thing we said was that it would be based on mobile. It would be somehow involving these devices. Welcome to The Market is Open. We will soon discuss how Square has grown so large, but we wanted to introduce you to Otis, an alternative investment fintech company whose support helped make this video. Feel free to support our sponsors as they help us make these videos by allowing us to do in-depth research. Otis is a fun way to diversify your portfolio by letting you buy alternative assets like a LeBron James rookie card. Through the Otis app, you can buy part of this asset just like a stock. How does this work? Otis physically owns the LeBron James rookie card and you're buying a portion of it. Or you may want to buy a different asset like 1985 Air Jordans. If you like art, you can buy a famous $450,000 painting by Banksy, an elusive British artist. How do you get out of the asset? Like a stock, you can sell it to another investor or Otis could sell it for its appraised value. You can place trades 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Otis is the stock market for culture, and if you're interested, then sign up with the link in the description and get your first share free when you fund your account. Terms apply. Jim McKelvey and Jack Dorsey hadn't quite decided on what product they would create. Like Dorsey, McKelvey was artistic. He left computer science in the mid-1990s to run a glass studio. This glass studio helped inspire his idea. So I was in my glass studio, I was trying to sell a piece of glass and the lady had a credit card that I couldn't process. And I was talking, uh, I was talking to her, it was a phone order, I was talking to her on, a, on an iPhone. I thought, why in the world can this thing not solve that problem? Jim designed the hardware and Jack designed the software by learning how to decipher the magnetic strip on a credit card into a readable audio sound. Take out your credit card and you look on the, the back, there's a magnetic strip. And that mag magnetic strip is actually the same technology that uh, you would use as in a cassette tape. Um, and if you actually play this uh, audio track, it sounds like a, a squirrel screeching. But if you, if you swipe it through, you actually hear that sound and you can write some software to decode that into a number. Perhaps inspired by this noise, the original name for the company was Squirrel. Like the icon was an acorn, there were squirrels all over the application. <laughs> Eventually, they wanted a new name, so Jack consulted the dictionary. I uh, went down the dictionary yeah. and um, found S keywords. You are kidding me. And no, and okay. I found the word square okay. and looked at uh, the definitions and I saw square up, right. which is to settle up, right. and fair and square. We want to bring more transparency to the financial right. world. This is why Square's website today still redirects to squareup.com. Because of the small size of the reader, 
they were able to significantly undercut the competition. The cheapest competitor's product was priced over $900 compared to free. How much do I have to pay? You, you just go to the website, squareup.com, and it's free to download the app. The device is actually free, so we send it to you in the mail for free. But it wasn't just the low cost. Most merchants were not allowed to accept payments because they had to go through a credit check and the banks only accepted 30% of them. While Square accepted everyone at first, then suspended the bad actors. It also made life simple by charging one rate of 2.75%. This compared to the banks, which could charge a lower fee, but also a much higher fee. A merchant doesn't pay one rate. They pay anywhere from 1.79% all the way to 10% to accept credit cards, depending on the card that you use. So how does Square work with the banks? Square performs this service as a payment aggregator and not as a bank. And we're the only one that doesn't require a merchant account. And the way we've set that up structurally is we have to work with an acquiring bank. We have an acquiring bank and we pass through and an acquiring bank is just a bank that works with a retailer. So if Walmart bank was Citigroup, then Citigroup would be Walmart's acquiring bank. Since Square is an aggregator, it is the one working with your business. So say you run a small coffee shop, it then deals directly with the acquiring bank. Therefore, Square aggregates these transactions from everyone who uses its service under its own name, allowing for efficiencies. Once the transaction is approved, the acquiring bank disperses the funds to Square. Square also disperses these funds to the retailers less its 2.75% fee. Despite Square being an extra middleman, the banks agree to work with it because it brings in many new customers. However, the banks did critique its low price. And the first thing they said to us, literally, was, you're being really stupid. You're leaving money on the table. People are used to paying for these things. And what we said, well, that's probably why you only have 7 million people processing credit cards with you today. We can bring that number way, way up. The low price helped its product go viral. By 2011, over 1 million merchants had signed up out of 8 million total in the United States. Those Square's merchants were typically small businesses. Also at this time, McKelvey stepped down from day-to-day -day activities, noticing that Jack was doing an excellent job. Dorsey was now the star of the show, and he was being recognized for his accomplishments beyond Twitter. But the success didn't go to his head, and he found pleasure taking the bus to work despite being nearly a billionaire. He has more recently taken an even less conventional approach of walking five miles to work every day. Square was also introducing new products beyond its payment services like Square Wallet, though this idea may still be too futuristic. We love it because you download it, you link your credit card once, and you leave your phone in your bag or your pocket and you walk up to the counter and say, I'd like a cookies and cream ice cream, and just put it on Jack. It's like opening a tab with the entire city. Paying with your face never caught on and Wallet was discontinued in 2014. But from Wallet emerged the popular Cash App. Despite Cash App's eventual success, investor excitement dimmed as the company moved towards its initial public offering. While it was valued at $6 billion in October 2014, the value decreased to less than $5 billion by the time it went public on the New York Stock Exchange in November 2015. Uh, Fred Wilson blogs today, sometimes you just need to get the deal done. Yeah. The terms might suck, but the cash doesn't, so you do the deal and you live to fight another day. Does he's, that, does that sum up how you feel? Uh, he's, he's absolutely right. I mean, it's all about getting the business and accelerating the business, and, and that's what we came here to do today, and we did it. Square investors also feared that Dorsey would leave the company because he rejoined Twitter as CEO only a month earlier. This was met with a lot of criticism. Investors also worried that Square had only one niche business, which represented 95% of its revenue in 2015. They could not yet see the revenue from the exponentially growing Cash App business because Cash App was still too small, but growing quickly. It was growing so quickly that in July 2017, it announced 3 million users, and by the end of the year, it had 7 million. Still, Cash App only had 100 million in revenue in 2017. Its revenue exploded in 2018 and beyond, and it had over 1 billion in revenue in 2020. We will soon review how Cash App makes so much money, but first, what is Cash App? It is similar to Venmo by PayPal. Originally, Cash App only allowed friends to transfer money to each other. This type of application is called peer to peer payments. However, Dorsey was inspired by how people were using the Cash App. Um, it's called the Cash App or Square Cash. And um, we have seen people use it as their bank account now. 
and we are serving and underserved in the United States. Therefore, Square added new features like payroll deposit, Bitcoin trading, and eventually investing in 2020. On March 17, 2020, Square became the first company since 2006 to be approved for the controversial banking charter known as an Industrial Loan Company or ILC. Being an ILC is desirable as traditional banks like Citigroup are only allowed to do banking. An ILC lets Square be a bank and it allows it to still operate freely as a tech company. Bankers were stunned when the FDIC approved this application and the ICBA, which represents 99% of bankers, called the action unfair. So now that Square is a bank, how big can it get? Square's original business, which it calls Seller, was 75% of revenue or $3.5 billion in 2020. Most people are aware of the obvious parts of this business, such as swiping a credit card. But Square has continued to add new features, which has helped it earn larger accounts. For example, in 2020, over 30% of its customers have sales of more than $500,000 a year, up from only 3% in 2012. Larger businesses are attracted to many of its free and paid software features. Square provides free analytics. It also allows businesses to easily send custom invoices. It also has software that tracks an employee's time. But Square does not give all this software away for free. Its plan is to get sellers into its ecosystem by marketing attractive point of sale devices. Then it can cross sell these software businesses that link well to the original products. Square's software business is still small at $300 million or 6% of total revenue, but given it already has many customers, this represents an attractive opportunity. Square also has one more play in its seller ecosystem, Square Card. What is Square Card? When a seller receives funds, they can keep their money on their Square Card instead of transferring the balance to their bank account. The incentive is they have access to these funds immediately rather than having to wait for the money to transfer to their bank account. This is an attractive opportunity because if all Square sellers left their money in their account and then spent this money, then Square would collect another 2.5% transaction fee. Though this product is still small, with only $250 million being spent of the total $28.8 billion in the third quarter of 2020, it is growing very quickly. This product is also very similar to the popular consumer product, Cash App. The Cash App was growing very quickly before the pandemic, but the pandemic has pushed growth into overdrive. While Cash App was originally popular with the large unbanked population in the US, there is more to it than this. While Cash App is not technically yet a bank account, it is often mistaken for one. As mentioned, Square recently received its banking charter, but it is unclear if the plan is for Cash App users to get deposit insurance. If there is insurance, then growth would markedly accelerate. Cash App makes 30% of its money from people spending at retailers. While the card is technically a prepaid debit card, meaning it is not tied to an official bank account, it is tied to the Cash App, making it feel like a bank account. Square users can then make payments either by swiping their card or tapping their phone. Square then takes a 2.75% transaction fee. Cash App made a further 600 million or 43% of its revenue from users who wanted to either move money instantly to their bank account, which comes at a 1.5% fee, or if they wanted to pay through their credit card. Square allows users to pay with a linked credit card for a 3% fee. 17% of Cash App, or 200 million in revenue, comes from users who use Cash App for their business. Why would someone register as a business account when Square's peer-to-peer -peer payment app is free? Well, Cash App has a monthly receiving limit of $1,000, so if you're a business, you may want to accept more money. What is even more exciting is money goes from a Cash App buyer to a Cash App seller, meaning Square takes both sides of the 2.75% transaction fee, and the transaction is completely outside the clutches of of Visa and MasterCard. 10% of Cash App or 100 million in revenue is generated when users place stock trades. While this isn't a huge part of revenue, it gives the company a lot of marketing coverage. It also makes Cash App feel like a bank account. Finally, Cash App has one more part of its ecosystem called Boost, which is essentially a loyalty card where a user can get, say, 10% off a pizza. The unique part of Boost is Square users receive the money right after they make a purchase, and this could be immediately spent again. Right now, Square funds the cost for these rewards, but in the future, it hopes the retailer would pay for Square's own loyalty program because Square would provide them with analytics showing they could increase sales. Why is Jack Dorsey so excited about Bitcoin? 
I, you know, I think the Bitcoin white paper is one of the most seminal works of computer science in the last 20, 30 years. He is excited because of the international business opportunity that Bitcoin represents. And this is one of the reasons why he announced that he was moving to Africa in late 2019, though the pandemic has delayed his African visit for now. The inspiration is that there are many corrupt countries in Africa where people cannot accept payments reliably. An example from a different corrupt country in Venezuela, Bitcoin is already used for 10% of transaction as people do not trust the hyperinflationary boulevard. Square's idea is to leverage its strong brand name to provide a bank for Bitcoin users. Importantly, Bitcoin is also free from governmental regulations. How do you see Bitcoin and cryptocurrency enabling Square to be more of a global company and to really have this international reach? I, it's, I mean, like if, if, we, if, we were to able, if we were able to use it as a currency today, as a, as a payment mechanism today, um, we could release our apps in every app store around the world instead of the five that we're in currently. Right now, none of this exists, and Square's revenue from Bitcoin is limited to taking a 2% fee for mostly American traders who want to buy and sell the digital asset. These traders spent $4 billion in 2020, so Square made approximately $80 million in profit. But in the future, Dorsey dreams of a digital currency bank account that people could use across the world to quickly send payments. Also, Square is not just backing Bitcoin. Its final product, Square Capital, has gotten a lot of coverage because it is very similar to what a bank does. But Capital's revenue collapsed in 2020 to 50 million from 100 million in 2019. Square Capital, like a bank, originates loans, but unlike a bank, it doesn't keep these loans. It sells them to third parties for a fee. However, Square Capital symbolizes Square metaphorically stepping its toe into the banking waters, and maybe Square will soon lead the banking revolution through its technology. I mean, do you think it's possible that in the next five to 10 years, we would see any of these big tech companies become banks as we've traditionally known them? Um, I, I think that definition of a bank will evolve rather than com companies becoming or tech companies becoming more like banks and I think you know things like digital currencies and the blockchain change the definition as well when you don't have um, particular parties who control the, the currency or any of the gates um, it requires a new definition. So Square has gone from payments processor to digital bank. Its future plans for growth would be using its banking charter to continue to grow its banking operations in the United States. It also plans to use Bitcoin to become an international bank for Bitcoin. If this happens, Dorsey will have evolved the definition of what is a bank. If you like this video, please subscribe or support us on Patreon. We spend a while researching these topics, so we appreciate you watching and your support.